Hello everyone, my name is Ali Farhadi Poor. I'm a student in the Department of Theater in uh, the University of Ottawa in the class Theater 5130 with Dr. Yana Mirzan. And uh, today I'm going to talk about possible words of fiction and history, which is a work from Lubomir Dolezel. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his name properly. And I hope that I pronounce all the names properly, which I doubt. <laughs> I'm sorry, because I don't know their pronunciation. Let me give you a friendly introduction. The background that you see is uh, for uh, an Iranian, a Persian, ancient Persian celebration, uh, which, which is a celebration on December 21st. It's like between December 20th and 21st at midnight, which is the winter solstice. Which is actually a name of the name of one of the, the plays we we read in this class. Uh, it is a, a time for this, uh, celebrating the birth of light uh, or the birth of Mitra. They were calling it in Iran and Europe. So they they believe in ancient Iran and ancient Europe both before Christ. Uh, that on this time between 20th and 21st at midnight, the light was being born and uh, the light they were calling it Mitra or the Sol Invictus or basically the, the God of light. Uh, and in Iran, the same concept was there. We were calling it, uh, we still call it actually Shabachel, which means the night of 40s or Shabe Yalda, which means the night of the birthday, something like that, uh, which means actually yeah, the birth of light, the night in which uh, the light was born. It's an interesting uh, celebration because uh, even Christmas was being celebrated on December 21st in Europe. But uh, around uh, 4th century, I think, Mm, uh, they changed the calendar, so it was pushed to December 25th, but, 5th, but we still celebrate it uh, almost closely uh, with four days difference. Uh, actually, we have the same trees and light. It's a very interesting celebration. I love it. Anyway, let's go to our presentation. In this presentation, uh, basically because I am a presentation expert, uh, I do something interesting. Uh, I've seen that some uh, people, when they do presentation, they show something on the, on the slide, but uh, they, they don't read it. They talk about something else, they give an introduction about it. But if you want to give it an introduction, it's better to give it before going to the slide. So that's uh, what I'm trying to, fo to follow, my own instructions and the instructions in the world of presentation skills. So when I, when I show a slide, I read it first, then I talk about it. If I pause, I tell you that I pause. And it is helpful as well because uh, I have Persian accent and if I read it, it's even very helpful in understanding what I'm saying. How can a conceptual system of possible words can be created? Uh, this is the main concept that uh, Dolezel is dealing with in his work. Theoretical background. In his classic paper, Semantical Considerations on Modal Logic, Saul A. Kripke proposed a model structure for modal logic and interpreted it semantically in terms of possible words. So as you see, this concept of possible words has a lot of connections with the uh, logic, modal, structures and all kinds of these logical, somehow philosophical um, contexts. According to Leibniz, who is a very famous philosopher, not only modal logic, but the whole system of logic has been re reformulated on the assumption that our actual world is surrounded by an infinity of other possible words. As you, okay, let's stop at the first, at the end of first paragraph. 
Uh, as you see, Leibniz believed that there are possible worlds that surround us, but uh, they never happened, uh, but they are just there. And uh, we will see that uh, how, how these kinds of possible worlds were going to be found in the kind of classical view of this concept. A host of logicians have worked on this. Logicians such as Jaco, Hintika, Dana, Scott, George H. Van Wright, David Lewis, David Kaplan, Robert Stalnecker, MJ Cresswell, and others. So this is the background that some people worked on this. It's good to mention their names. Put it simply, in Thomas Scone's words, a possible word is a way our world might have been. It's very interesting quote, I, I like it. It's like, it, our world could be like this. I mean, like this, I mean like the possible world that we can imagine. Uh, this Mr. Cohn says, in our world, the Earth has only a single natural satellite, the moon. But there are other possible worlds in which the Earth has two or more satellites or has none at all. Yeah. So it, this is at the end of paragraph one. As you know, there is a concept in physics uh, that they say there might be multiverses. Verse means board. It's like, OK. There might be other verses that their actually conditions are very different than ours. Paragraph two, there are also possible worlds less like ours. Some in which there is no earth or planet and still others in which not even the laws of nature are the same. That's what exactly uh, new physicists say. Actualism and possibilism. For possibilism, the actual world does not have a different status within the set of possible worlds. While for actualism, the actual world is a standpoint outside the system of possible worlds from which judgments of actuality, which are not word the relative, may be made. During the 1970s, the idea of possible words expanded far beyond modal logic to recast many traditional problems of philosophy. Later on, it became an interdisciplinary paradigm, which provided new insights into theoretical issues of natural, social, and human sciences. So, which is interesting that this concept of possible words was expanded beyond even modal logic and it went to other disciplines. The first adjustment concerns the origin of possible worlds. In Leibniz's metaphysical conception, possible worlds have trans transcendental existence. They reside in the omniscient divine mind. They are discovered by an exceptional intellect or imagination. So that's how Leibniz, the philosopher, was very famous, uh, conceived this concept. He believed that uh, they exist, so we just have to find them, discover them. They are in the mind of God. MJ Cresswell says, in contemporary thinking, possible words are stipulated, not discovered, by powerful uh, telescopes. Possible words are things we can talk about or imagine, suppose, believe in, or wish for. So you see the kind of uh, transition between that view, which was classical, they believe that possible words exist somewhere in the mind of God, uh, or in some like word of maybe idea, platonic uh, uh, ideas. But uh, the, the more we went forward, so, Philosophers and theor theorists uh, discovered that no possible words are being created, actually being constructed. 
So they are constructs. Fictional words of literature are a specific kind of possible words. They are artifacts produced by textual poesis. Poesis, as you know, is a, a Greek word, ancient Greek word, which means a creation, kind of creation out of nothing. Oh, I mean, put it simply. And uh, let's read uh, the sentence. Uh, let's go backward a bit. They are artifacts, I mean, fictional words are artifacts produced by textual poesis and preserved and circulating, circulated in the medium of fictional texts. They constitute a subset in a broader class of fictional words constructed by, by various kinds of creative activities, such as mythology, storytelling, painting, and sculpting, dance and opera, theater, cinema, television. So as you see, these kinds of uh, fictional words in literature, they are being created through writing. So uh, it means kind of that as long as you don't write them, they don't exist. So we will get there that which, which one is first, text or uh, possible words. So when, before, for example, before writing Hamlet, did Hamlet exist? That's the question. Hamlet is not a man to be found in the actual world. Obviously, he's a possible person inhabiting an alternative world, the fictional world of Shakespeare's play. Yeah, that's how Dodorizel nicely put it, uh, which means Hamlet didn't exist. I mean, there might have been some Hamlets somewhere, but uh, basically, uh, what Deleuze is trying to say is that mm, we will get there shortly, that uh, there is no uh, direct connection between uh, people, like kind of original characters who existed in actual world, but uh, some people, some authors came and wrote something about them. And uh, so they are different. We will, we will get there. So, I, I'm just saying this to create more curiosity. Fictional reference. That's an, uh, one of the uh, important notions and concepts uh, about possible words. By expanding the universe of discourse, possible words semantics gives legitimacy to the concept of fictional reference. Yeah, this is a word from the as well. Uh, this means that uh, po uh, these kinds of possible words that we see in the world of literature, they kind of are, I mean, wrongfully, Dolezal says, that they are wrongfully called self-referential, -refer which means they refer to themselves. But uh, this is maybe a more accurate word, fictional reference. So they have a fictional reference. They refer to the fictional world that already has been created in the text. So it can be play or novel. The principle of ontological homogeneity. The principle of, uh, the principle of ontological homogeneity is a necessary condition for the coexistence, interaction, and communication of fictional persons. It epitomizes the sovereignty of fictional words. Yeah, this is a word from Dorizel as well. Uh, this means that actually all the characters we see in novels or plays, they uh, have the same, they are the same kind. They are fictional. It can be a, we can have a play or novel about Napoleon or some other historical characters. But that fictional character in that play or novel, it doesn't have, uh, it's not different than any other characters like Hamlet, Macbeth, or any other character that can be totally fictional. And uh, this is kind of, so they are homogeneous, uh, theoretically. We cannot uh, kind of discriminate between them or distinguish, make make uh, 
distinctions between them. We say, no, this is more real because uh, this Napoleon has been created, for example, in uh, the Tolstoy's work, War and Peace. So that Napoleon is not more real than Hamlet, for example. Second paragraph, as non-actualized possibles, all fictional entities are of the same ontological nature. Tolstoy's Napoleon is no less fictional than his peer Bezuchov, and Dickens' London no more actual than Carol's Wonderland. It's a very interesting analogy. Yeah, these are all from uh, Deleuze. A view which presents fictional persons as a mixed bag of real people and purely fictitious characters leads to serious the theoretical difficulties, analytical confusions, and naive critical practice. This is a quote from Deleuze. So we cannot say they are a mixed uh, bag of reality and fiction. No, they are all fictional, uh, theoretically. Possible word semantics versus doctrine of uh, mimesis, which is a very famous doctrine in theater and cinema. Possible word semantics of fictionality is in opposition to the ancient and stubborn doctrine, doctrine of mimesis that derives fictional entities from actual prototypes. So uh, this is a word from the result, as you see, this means uh, that this uh, new theory, possible words theory, let's say, or possible words semantics, it's totally different than the classical uh, uh, theory of mimesis. So as I mentioned, they, are, they have fictional reference and uh, they are not uh, imitating something else. They are themselves. They are kind, they are not representational. They are presentational. They are themselves. They are fiction. Relationship between possible words and reality. It's very interesting. So that's where I was getting to. Possible words semantics insists that fictional words are not imitations or representations of the actual word re realia but sovereign realms of possibilia. As such, they establish diverse relationships to the actual world, situate themselves at a closer or further distance from reality. They range from realistic worlds closely resembling the actual world to those violating its laws, like fantastic worlds. So uh, that's very interesting. We are going deeper and deeper. We see that it's not that fiction, because they are fiction, they have no relationship with the actual world. No, they have. But they can be s more similar or less similar, up to the extent of uh, being totally different and opposite. And uh, one of the examples is from the, the play we read, The Arabian Night, from Shimel Fring, if I'm pronouncing properly. Uh, uh, in that, there was a character named the Karpati. He goes into a bottle and it's totally different. The, the world that we see there is totally different. And a man can go into a bottle. So uh, this is a, an example that uh, in the, an example of being totally different. So we have realistic uh, plays as well that, uh, or naturalistic. And uh, if I'm actually remembering the name properly, there is a, a play from Maxim Gorky uh, from the depth. Uh, the, the, it's about some some people, um, and it's very naturalistic, very realistic. And uh, in those kinds of plays, we have uh, more similarity to the actual world. Possible counterparts of the historical figures. Brutus might not have killed Caesar. Trotsky might have become the leader of the Soviet Union. Nixon could have been a car salesman. Yeah, Dorzel says that. And uh, this is interesting uh, because we have a concept of possible counterparts, which is kind of uh, a kind of, yeah, something that could have happened or 
the way things might have ended up, but they didn't. So these are possible counterparts. Which comes first, fiction, fictional text or possible word, as I was mentioning earlier? The word constructing power of the fictional text implies the text is prior to the fictional word, that it calls the word into existence and determines its structure. Uh, as I mentioned, so text is first. It's not that Im imaginary word exists somewhere. As long as uh, they are not written on the paper or like typed, they don't exist. When they are typed, they get some kinds of existence. So even if they exist in the mind of the author, that's an interesting concept here. Unlike historical narratives, fictional texts as performatives are outside truth valuation. Their sentences are neither true nor false. The loser. So uh, it's not like history. So we can say, uh, who was the, I don't know, first president of the Uni United States? So we cannot change that in history. But in fictional texts, you cannot say, did really Hamlet uh, like uh, kill his uh, uncle or not? Did the ghost appear to Hamlet or not? We cannot really ask that. Whatever is in the play is in the play. <laughs> Truth valuation of possible words. There was no word, no life, no death of Emma Bovary prior to Gustave Flaubert's authenticating act. Like before writing it, Madame Bovary didn't exist. But it is appropriate, indeed necessary, to ask whether a historian of literature is right when he states that Emma died of tuberculosis. His constative, his statement about the fictional word of Emma Bovary is subject to truth valuation, the result. That's interesting. So we cannot ask whether Hamlet existed or not, but we can ask, did Hamlet kill his uncle at the end of the play? Similarity between history and fiction. Since historical writing shows features of literature, such as emplotment, poetic and rhetorical tropes and figures, semantic indeterminism and ambiguity. There is no fundamental difference between history and fiction, the result. As you saw, uh, even historical writing, a historical narrative, it has a lot of similarities with fiction. Next paragraph. The aim of the writer of a novel must be the same as that of the writer of a history. Both wish to provide a verbal image of reality. So they are trying to depict reality with words, let's say. So in these regards, they are the same. In his later work, White retreats to a more moderate position. The Luzel says that about White. So uh, Hayden White uh, is the person who gave these statements. And uh, it, they were cited in Deleuze's work. So he later changed his view. He said, no, they are different. History and fiction are different. Distinction between fiction and history. Distinction between fiction and history must be preserved. To quote one, Paul Ricoeur defined fiction in contrast to the truth claims of historical narrative. End of first paragraph, let's talk about it. Ricoeur says that in uh, history, there are attempts, there is an uh, intention to, um, to match the reality. But in fiction, there is no uh, such attempt. Paul Ricoeur says, I'm referring the term fiction for those literary creations that do not have historical narratives ambition to constitute a true narrative. So it's like the virtue of uh, the historical narratives is not uh, like fiction, that uh, you, they can do anything they want. No, historical narratives, they have to match some evidence. Historians, last paragraph, historians who write narrative histories generally try to provide a fair overall representation of the central subject of 
their narrative. In this sense, historical narratives can be true as a whole, whereas fictional narratives cannot. So if a historical narrative generally gives a, an accurate picture of uh, the main subject, it can be a war, it can be a person, so it is accurate, but fiction doesn't have this feature. Another similarity between fiction and history, only if we posit that language is monofunctional, that all language uses poetic, non-referential, or as it is inappropriately called self-referential, the opposition between fictional and cognitive texts disappears. So it is obvious that it means that if we consider them literature, so they're the same. And in that regard, they can be read equally, which is not really true in my view. I explain more. Another difference between fiction and history. Fiction makers practice a radically non-essentialist semantics. They give themselves the freedom to alter even the individuating properties and well-known life episodes of historical persons. This is important. That's why a part of the explanation I, 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 I said I'm going to give is that uh, fiction writers, they feel free to change the properties of a person, I mean, attr the attributes of a person, or even events. They can do whatever they want. But historians cannot really do that. Unless in some minor places, when there is a gap, uh, and there is no evidence. So they have to fill out the gap. Uh, Victor. Klovsky investigated in detail the choices that uh, Tolstoy made when writing War and Peace. Tolstoy omitted historical facts, which did not suit his aesthetic and ideological purpose. So as you see, Tolstoy even felt, felt free to do anything he wanted. But even in, in those uh, uh, instances, in instances, like we see that they try to kind of keep a kind of closeness to the picture that is in the people's minds. They try to do that, so they draw on it. Uh, it's a very nuanced uh, work that uh, authors do. Shklovsky comes, in the last paragraph, Shklovsky comes to the conclusion that war and peace is not history, but the canonization of a legend. The same source from Dolzell. It is possible in a fiction like George Kaiser's play, Napoleon in New Orleans, 1937, for Napoleon to be rescued from the island, taken to North America, and die in New Orleans, Dolzell. But it is essential to the historical Napoleon that he died at St. Helena, Dolzell. So as you see, Uh, in a fiction, Napoleon doesn't have to die even in the place that he really died, that, that, the, that the actual historical Napoleon died. He can't die anywhere. But in history, we cannot change that. He died at St. Helena. The virtue of historians. Historians are involved in a continuous refining of the pictures of the past in order to maximize the similarity. So as we see, uh, historians are kind of always in the process of uh, refining the story when there is new evidence or when they actually they compare evidence, evidences and other sources. So they come to some kind of other conclusions and other uh, historians arrive. While we will never know how many children had Lady Macbeth in the words of Macbeth, that is not because to know this would require knowledge beyond the capacity of human beings. It is because there is nothing of the sort to know. Walter Stroff. So it's interesting concept. It's, it's like we cannot even ask how many children Lady Macbeth had. It's a kind of wrong question. It, <laughs> it doesn't have a basis. We, can't, we don't have a way to find out whether 
how many or did he she ha have any children or not another similarity between fictional and historical worlds both are incomplete why both fictional and historical worlds are by necessity incomplete to construct a complete possible world would require writing a text of infinite length it's very interesting it means that we never we are never able to write a hundred percent accurate history because always we take a point of view we have to limit ourselves how many volumes we are going to write about it what factors we are going to take into consideration who which sources we are going to look at and even if, if we have all the sources so how can we put them into a narrative so narrative works like a kind of gate when it comes to a gate uh, and actually always you have limitations because you cannot have different narratives but in reality in history in actual world different narratives are going at the same time the guy is thinking like uh, something the guy is something else. he does something he does something else but in narrative we are all the time bound we have always one point to look at, one point to talk about, which is one of the actually limitations. But if we have an infinite length of, a, for example, a book or novel or play, yeah, we might be able to cover everything if you have all the uh, sources. Incompleteness and limitations of history. So how history even is incomplete? The first source of gaps is the historian's selectivity guided either by purely practical considerations, the scope of the investigation, or by chosen plot structure, as I mentioned, the narrative and plot. Whatever the motivation, these gaps result from a conscious decision on the part of the historian about the relevance of the facts. Baron uh, said that in the contemporary relevance of history. Uh, this is very important. So there is a scope of investigation always uh, for a historian, and he always has to say, okay, is this relevant or not? Should I say it now or later or not at all? So these are the limitations that historians deal with. The other kind of gaps in historical wars are due to the lack of evidence can be filled when new documents become available, the result. Oh, he, Trevor Rapper, we are let into the historian's workshop, what he's doing as a historian, watching him perform two roles simultaneously, that of a detective who uncovers or is given documents about a mysterious person, and that of a writer who constructs a model of that person's life, Trevor Rapper, a hidden life. Uh, that's very interesting. And uh, always historian is kind of switching or oscillating between being a detective and a writer. So, uh, uh, and he's always looking for new evidence. And uh, as, as it goes back to what I said, like he has to find all the evidences, but always he's a writer. So he had to construct something tangible for us, something that we can understand or somehow even like uh, I'm not going to say re re relate to it's more fictional thing but uh, um, we have to understand it in a way like relate in the way that we have to understand it at a kind of human level and uh, it has to be it has to be translated into our understanding which we will get later it's a kind of epistemological uh, thing as well so uh, uh, that's interesting. Sometimes, actually, we have historical people that uh, they don't, uh, they, they, their brains even were not functioning like, our, our, like us. They were thinking differently. Maybe someone is, uh, I don't know, like a, a sociopath or um, like, uh, how do you say in English? Like people who kill uh, many people, serial killers. So, Sometimes they have a different mentality. So how can we even depict them as a historian? How can we understand them? These are challenges. Or even some people who might be like, might have some difficulties in terms of uh, thinking. They have maybe limitations. Maybe there is a person that goes into a, a unconscious 
state like Nietzsche, for example, for the last 10 years of his life, he was, how can we write a history about him? It's interesting. We always can see from outside. We cannot get into his brain somehow. Historical relativism. Uh, okay, which means history is not absolute or objective. Historical rel relativism claims that history cannot give an objective representation of the past because it is always biased by the moment of its writing, the dolezal. That's interesting. So it, 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 it's different. If I write it now or if I write it 10 years later, or if I, if I write it or if another person writes 200 years later. Maurice Mandelbaum, second paragraph, whatever truth a historical work contains is relative to the conditioning processes under which it arose and can only be understood with reference to those processes by the historian's personality, the politics of his class and country, and the mental climate of his times, the problem of historical knowledge. This is a quote from Mandelbaum. And uh, it's interesting. So always historian is biased by politics, his class, country, or mental climate, like epistemology of his age. All right, totalitarian historiography which actually uh, exists in a lot of places in the world. Elimination of evidence and evidence forging. That's what it is about. They either eliminate evidence or they forge. There is a good example in Dolezal's work, uh, Voroshilov, Molotov, Stalin, and Yezhov at the Moscow Volga Canal. On the left, you see. So on the right, so this guy, uh, Yezhov. Uh, he got into some problems with the Stalin and the, then he, they removed him even from the picture. So as you see on the right, in the, on the right side, the same photo with Yezhov removed. So yeah, elimination of evidence. Distorted history. So sometimes even they create history in some cases, totalitarian, countries, or even in other countries so, or societies. Even in democratic societies, it might happen. Uh, distorted history is a history that never happened. And in this respect, but only in this respect, it is similar to counterfactual histories. Uh, and, and so let's uh, stop here. What is counterfactual histories? It, it, is a, uh, it is like this. We say, oh, OK, if, if, he didn't, if he wouldn't have died, what would happen? And uh, that's interesting. In the fourth uh, sister we were reading in the class, uh, in that uh, play, we actually had some kind of like that. If the father hadn't died, you know, we can approach it from that perspective. And uh, if he hadn't died, what would happen? So uh, that's in the world of fiction play. But in, uh, in history, even we can have it. So sometimes historians talk about this. Okay, if Alexander didn't attack Asia, what would happen? <laughs> I mean, they try to come up with some alternatives. Uh, second paragraph and last, for the historical model of the Russian Revolution, the difference is crucial. It is a difference between an adequate and a distorted image, the result. So as you see, uh, this is important that, uh, yeah, um, in some cases, the that it's not that uh, counterfactual history. It's not counterfactual history that Yezhov existed. <laughs> uh, we cannot say, oh, if he did, if he never existed, what would happen? <laughs> you know, uh, that's different that, uh, from counterfactual history. Distorted history versus counterfactual history. Distorted history is a tool of totalitarian ideology. I would say, and any kind of ideology for enforcing its image of the past. So they want to take, change the picture of the past. But counterfactual history is a tool of historiography to help us understand better the actual past, the result, as I mentioned earlier. So we can use counterfactual history to understand what happened or what, I mean, what would happen if this and that wouldn't have happened? <laughs> uh, yeah. I think this is the last slide. If counterfactual histories are products of imagination 
as Trevor Rapper explicitly recognized, then the opposition between fiction writing and historiography turns into a circle. They meet when both no noesis, and it means knowing, and poesis, creating or constructing, are engaged in the construction of imaginally possible, imaginary possible worlds, Dolozel. Yeah, this means that uh, if they are both products of imagination, counterfactual history and fiction, so they are kind of meeting somewhere, like they are the same. They are products of imagination in that regard. So it's like the function is different. As Paul Ricoeur said, one is intention, one is function. So why do you do that? Why do you write that? What is your intention? If your intention is to uh, match uh, sources, I would even add something interesting. If I write a play or novel, and if I try to act right like a historian, if I go around, find evidence, talk to historians, try to be faithful to the actual world and whatever happened, even my work as a kind of play writer, it can be compared to a historian. Uh, that's interesting. And, uh, but, so the, the, as I said, that's intention, but the function. So what is the function? As about uh, counterfactual history we saw, so there is a, a function that it has. Whatever, what, what is its function? Is it written just for reading and enjoying as a fiction? Or no, we are reading it as a counterfactual history. So if it is presented to us as a counterfactual history, we can, Actually, we have the option, there is no force. We have the option to look at it as a, a counterfactual history, or we can look at it as a fiction. It's like, I don't want to understand it as a counterfactual history. That, so there is, that's an option that even uh, the reader has. So hopefully I didn't, didn't uh, make you bored. And these are the works cited, I gave a list of them. So if anyone wants, they can look at it. And yeah, that's the kind of, yeah, end of the race. <laughs> and uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you have questions, please uh, email me. I'm going to write my email here. I forgot. This is my email, Ali dot arhadipur at uottawa.ca yes wish you all the best new year and any years any days and nights have a nice time in life in history and even fiction, maybe. See you later.